everyone. On behalf of Cornell Cooperative Extension and Pro Dairy, I would like to welcome you to our Hoof Health and Lameness Program. My name is Casey Havikus. I am one of the Dairy Management Specialists on Cornell Cooperative Extension North Country Regional Ag Team, and I will be serving as your host for today. So our next speakers today are Lindsay Ferlito and Betsy Hicks. Lindsay is a regional dairy specialist on the North Country Regional Ag Team, and Betsy is a dairy specialist on the South Central New York field crops and livestock team. Lindsay and Betsy both have been conducting applied research focusing on cow comfort and facilities, delivering educational programs on cow comfort and lameness, and providing producers with herd specific feedback relative to regional benchmarks. So today their presentation is going to focus on risk factors and best management practices. So as Casey said, Betsy and I are going to go through some of the facility and management factors that could be impacting lameness on the farm and just talk about some of the best management practices and industry recommendations. We're going to talk about the lying area and how we can maximize getting cows in the stall and laying down, some other aspects of the pen and the barn environment, making sure that the cow has access to the resources that we're providing her, touch on trimming and foot baths, as well as understanding and tracking leanness on your farm so that you can manage it, and then ending with a couple examples of some case studies from some research that Betsy and I have worked on over the last few years. So just to start off, just getting an idea of where we're at as an industry. So as Kathy was mentioning, leanness is a very obvious welfare concern. It obviously causes the cow pain, and it's an obvious issue. So you can see when a cow is limping. So um, it doesn't take, doesn't always take a trained eye to see that a cow is lame. So if you have your dairy and it's open to the public, seeing lameness is obvious, whereas um, an untrained eye wouldn't necessarily see that a cow has mastitis or metritis or some other welfare issues. We also have some industry targets and recommendations. So the National Dairy Farm Program says that we should have less than 5% severe lameness in the lactating herd. So that's kind of our, you know, an ultimate goal for every farm. But ultimately, we should always be working to try to minimize lameness on farm. And we can see whether we're talking about tie cell farms or free cell farms and kind of depends on where you are across the country or, or the world. But we do have large ranges in averages, and these are total lameness prevalence, so this would be mild and severe. But we can see um, that as an industry, we do still have a lot of work to do in, in lowering that number. Um, but depending on the study, we are, we are doing better in some cases, it seems. So one of the most important things to help mitigate lameness is making sure that we're giving cows a comfortable place to lay down and making sure she has access to that stall or to that bed. So we know that cows will lay down, depending on her age and stage of lactation, anywhere from about 11 to 13 hours a day. Usually high producing cows are closer to 11 or 11 and a half hours a day. And we're putting a lot of constraints on this cow and Betsy will talk about access to resources a little bit later in time budgets, but making sure that we're giving her access to a comfortable place to lay down so she can when she wants to. So we know from multiple studies that line time is higher on deep beds. So if we're comparing deep bedded stalls, so that's like the picture in the middle there of those cows laying on sand, to a mattress, a mat, a waterbed, we will see higher line time on a deep bed. And we also see lower lameness and leg injuries on deep beds. So um, if we're comparing a deep bed to a non-deep bed, we see lower lameness. And then if we compare um, a bedded pack to a deep bed, we see, depending on the study, we see lower lameness on that bedded pack. So again, kind of that freedom for her to lay down where she wants in a soft space. And with bedding, it's, it's an obvious answer, more is better. So whatever we can do to increase bedding in those stalls, it's better for the cow. We see higher lying time when we have more bedding provided compared to less bedding. Um, and another study found that for every one inch reduction in bedding. So this was even just looking at within a deep bed over time as the bedding wore down in that stall, we start to see significant reductions in lying time. And then this does correspond to lameness. So we do see lower lameness on herds that had more bedding in the stalls. Again, it seems obvious, but we, we've got the data to prove it. That stall needs to be clean and dry. So cows actually do care if that bedding is dry and maintained and we've seen associations with herds that have dirtier stalls having higher lameness prevalence. Cows also like for that stall to be level, even so maintaining that bedding, especially if we're talking about a deep bed, 
maintaining that bed. And when we're talking about deep beds, it doesn't necessarily have to be sand. So with all of these, it doesn't you know it's not specific to a type of bedding. The most important thing is that we're giving her a lot of bedding and then it's staying clean and dry. So just a couple examples of some ways that producers are trying to make stalls a little bit more comfortable and accessible. The picture on the left is a farm that offers these green or flexible free stalls to select pens on their farm. So I've heard from producers, these are not great for first lactation heifers or animals that might abuse them a little bit more um, and be able to fit in kind of sideways, but they're great for looking at pre-fresh, older cows, fresh cows, maybe just a group of older animals that just need a little bit extra TLC. This just gives them a little bit more flexibility in that stall. Those stall partitions have a little bit more give than a traditional um, steel freestall. And then the example on the right is a farm that while maybe they can't make their stalls longer, they can provide some extra lunch space forward. So making those stalls just a little bit more appealing to those cows, because as you can see, especially some of those bigger ones, we've got lots of noses hanging out the end of that stall. So if there was a curtain right there, they would be smashing into that and then potentially starting to lay diagonally and not use those stalls the way we want. So they provided a little bit more lunch space and just gave those cows a bit more room to utilize those stalls. So I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but just as a reminder, these are the freestyle dimension recommendations from the University of Wisconsin Dairyland Initiative. They do a great job of providing this resource and updating it. And it's important to recognize, too, that they're giving recommendations based on cow size. So obviously, a cow today is a little bit bigger than cows 10 or 20 years ago. And if, we're ha you know, if we have a herd of Jerseys versus a herd of Holsteins, or even just a first lactation pen compared to a, a fourth lactation pen, recognizing how big our animals are, and then adjusting our stalls accordingly, especially giving those pre-fresh and fresh cows more space. And then if we're looking at high stall facility, these are some of the recommendations from some studies in the U.S. as well as the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture. And they're looking again at sizing up the stalls based on the cow size. So here you would measure some of your cows and get an idea then of how large your tie stall needs to be. And while stalls are not necessarily always an easy thing to change uh, in terms of size, it is important that we're designing them and sizing them appropriately because it can have an impact on, on that cow behavior and on lameness. So from previous research, we know that cows like bigger stalls. We see increased lying time with wider stalls and with more lunge space. And smaller stall size, whether that's width or length, has been associated with higher lameness. Cows also don't like any sort of obstructions that we add there. So like having that curtain and not enough lunge space or having um, an aggressive brisket board that has been associated with higher lameness. And the neck rail also was really important for lameness because that has a big impact on how the cow can utilize that stall. So this was a study from a few years back now from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. What they did was they looked at basically a scenario where you had no neck rail. So they moved it really far forward in the stall. And then a, a, a different scenario where you have a neck rail and it's quite an aggressive neck rail. So this is kind of an extreme case, but showing the impact that that neck rail can have. And what they did was they tracked these animals in those different pens and looked at their lameness score or their gait score week after week. They all, all the animals kind of started at an average just below a three. So they were just below being considered clinically lame on a five point scale. And if you look at this graph in the middle here, the red bar here are the cows that had that aggressive neck rail. And we can see that within about three weeks, they are now scoring worse and they're now considered clinically lame. Whereas the cows that did not have a neck rail actually got a little bit better. And then they reversed the treatments. And again, we saw that the cows that were exposed to that neck rail started to get worse within a few weeks. And then the cows that didn't have that neck rail got better in terms of lateness. And the biggest thing that they found wasn't necessarily a huge impact on lying time because the cows still kind of forced their way into that stall and, and found a way to lay down. What the graph on the right is showing us was that the biggest difference with that aggressive neck rail is that cows can't stand with all four feet in the stall. That is kind of that extra obstruction like that brisket board that yes, maybe on farms, it's helping to keep those stalls clean. And it's something that as a management tool, it's better for the farm. But in terms of the cow, she wants more space to do what she wants to utilize that stall. So by letting her stand with all four feet in that stall and reduce that two foot perching, we're going to limit or um, minimize that risk to lameness, especially on those hind hooves that are standing on wet concrete. So looking at, you know, we've looked at the, the lying space now, where is she walking, where is she moving around, looking at the flooring and alleyways. Again, cleanliness is key and studies, this is actually from some data from um, Novus and some studies they did on herds across the country 
they found that more frequent manure removal from pen alleyways was associated with lower lateness. Um, doesn't seem shocking. You know, keeping that alleyway clean and drier is going to be better for her hoof health. The strategic use of rubber. So we see in herds that have long walkways to the parlor and they put, you know, a two foot stretch of rubber down the alleyway and the cows will line up and go single file down down to get to the parlor. So cows do like rubber. It's obviously softer than concrete, but strategic use of it. So we don't necessarily need it everywhere. And we need to make sure still that that rubber is, has good traction and it's also being kept clean and maintained. Proper grooving is key. We want to make sure these cows have traction and that we're not um, allowing them to slip and fall because obviously leg injuries could be contributing to lameness as well. And if a cow was lame, we want to make sure she's got solid footing so that she can move around the pen and get to the parlor. And just keeping extra attention whenever we have a slope or a turn coming in and out of parlor, maybe that's where we want to utilize um, some rubber and ensure that our grooving is, is up to snuff to make sure that we're not providing her with an opportunity to fall. Also need to touch on um, the impact of heat stress. So I think we're learning more and more as an industry too, just how bad heat stress can be for cows of all stages of lactation. And I think we're probably going to be adjusting that number potentially. So as low as a THI of 68 degrees, cows are going to be having negative impacts of heat stress. We're going to see reduced feed intake, increased water intake, reduced milk production, reduced fertility. We can have bunching behavior in the pen as well as reduced lying time. And those are obviously going to be increased risk factors for lameness. So it's really important that we're considering how we're managing our herds throughout the year and make sure that we're providing adequate heat abatement um, again, so that these cows can eat and drink and lay down like we want them to. Um, in terms of ventilation, we want to have 40 to 60 air exchanges per hour. So we're moving the whole air volume of the barn and bringing in fresh air. But then from a heat abatement perspective, we want to have air speed and we want it down at the cow level. So, you know, on a nice hot summer day, it's always nice walking down the feed lane of a barn because the air is just flying through there because there's no obstructions. What's actually happening in the stalls at the feed bunk are those cows feeling cool when they're in that stall area where we want her to be. And more and more data now is proving the economics of providing heat abatement for all classes of cows. So dry cows, far off, pre-fresh, fresh, holding area, basically everywhere in your barn, your cows should have heat abatement. And don't forget to clean your fans, fans that are excessively dirty and dusty that can significantly reduce um, the efficacy. So make sure that we're maintaining those fans. And I put this in, it's not necessarily a feasible option for, for a lot of farms, but I think we can still learn from it. So providing access to pasture does have benefits. Again, some of the data from Novus found that providing access to pasture, even if it was just during the dry period, was associated with lower herd level lameness. And the study on the right there shows that when we had cows that were housed indoors on nice deep bed stalls, when they were provided access to pasture, their gait score actually started to improve within just a couple of weeks compared to the cows that stayed indoors and they kind of just maintained their gait score. So we know that getting cows out on pasture while maintained can be beneficial to lameness, whether that's feasible or not. But what we can learn from that is that she's clearly telling us that getting her off of concrete and onto a softer surface, whether it's to stand up outside and to graze or to have a softer surface and more freedom to lay down, so how can we apply that into our free stalls, making sure that they're large enough, we have enough bedding, um, we're giving her access, and then maybe utilizing that bedded pack or some box stalls where appropriate to give her more of that freedom. So now I'm going to hand it off to Betsy and she's going to talk about access to resource and some other things to consider. Thanks, Lindsay. So the reason I really like to present with Lindsay is we complement each other's strengths really well. Lindsay comes at cow behavior from a facilities perspective and, and talking about cow comfort and, and the impacts upon that. I come at things from a slightly different perspective from the nutritional aspect. And um, I think the two really go hand in hand. And so from, from this point, we're gonna talk a little bit more about nutrition uh, and management, cow behavior and access to resources from the nutritional aspect. So I'm going to start with this slide for my, my section. Rick Grant with Minor Institute talks about the cow's dining experience. So in a perfect world, the cow can eat when she wants, eat without competition, and lie down comfortably after she eats. So when we manage cows, what do we do to that cow to impact those three things? And then specifically, when we're thinking about lame cows, how is she, how, how does that lameness impact when she can do these things and what does her behavior tell her that she actually wants to do. 
So from that, we know that cows would rather rest than eat. Um, and so increased stocking density, um, we'll call it a risk factor for lameness. But you know, when we think about lameness, it's really like a circular thing that we can either impact lameness positively or negatively. So we know with increased stocking density, cows have greater aggressive aggression and displacements at the feed bunk. The time of eating shifts might be impacted because she doesn't eat when she wants to eat. Um, she will eat fewer meals and her eating rate increases because she doesn't know when some boss cow is going to come by and push her out of the way. And then she also has a greater potential for sorting feed if there's increased stocking density. The thing to take away from this is that cows that are most impacted, those are subordinate cows, which we know sick cows lame cows and first calf heifers. And so the lame cows in general, you know, if we're impacting how much she wants to lay down, she'd rather rest than eat. She wants to go lay down. Her feet don't feel good. She's going to go lay down and then it's going to increase uh, the effects of what the stocking density does. So think something to keep in mind that we're going to strategically use our stocking density. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, so the next thing I wanted to touch on uh, from nutrition aspect is push-up frequency. So you can see in this picture here, um, you can see this cow reaching for the feed that obviously hasn't been pushed up or delivered any time recently. And the thing we can remember, neck injuries are you know common when we see feed aren't pushed up. Cows can exert over 500 pounds of force to reach feed and tissue damage occurs after 250 pounds of force. So, you know, we think about this bar being pushed out and the force that it takes for her to reach this feed and, and get out there. So we see neck injuries for that. The other thing we want to remember is when she's pushing with that, where's the force that's on her neck, but it's also on her feet pushing to get to that feed. So if we see this, we shouldn't be seeing it, right? So we should not have the same stimulatory effect of feed delivery when we do push up feed. Um, if the cows are rushing to get up and eat, it's probably a pretty good indication. We need to push up feed more frequently. So I don't want to see cows rushing up and I don't want to see neck injuries. So if we're seeing both of those, we need to, we can probably positively impact our lameness just by pushing up feed more, more frequently. The next thing I want to touch on is time away from pen. We all know, um, there's multiple things we do to cows in a 24 hours to impact how much time they have to do their their normal activities in a day. This review paper, if you haven't read it, it's a really great review paper by Cook and Nordland in 2009. It really goes through a lot of things that, you know, we know, but they really put into perspective. So they just discuss that a one or two hour change in time budget for a cow is generally manageable for them to do what they need to do. But they do discuss that prolonged lockups or when you lock a cow up and there's other stressors like lameness. Um, these can be super detrimental to her daytime activities. So it, it impacts the ability of the cow to compensate and catch up on her lying time. It's really not a good thing if we have these other stressors and she's lame and we do things to her. This study in 2007 talked about depriving cows of two to four hours of lying time a day. For, they were away from feed. After 40 hours, they were allowed back to their normal hours, and they only recovered about 40% of that lost lying time. So when we think about our time away from pen or the time we spend locking cows up, who are the cows we're locking up? Generally, it's those that are recently calved, and these cows are very susceptible to changes in their daily standing time. And then getting to this last study, um, talking about time away from pen and milking time, it's, it's an older study and we all know this, but I put it up here because it's just a good reminder. So lame cows are often the slowest to enter the parlor and these cows are particularly sensitive to issues of parlor throughput. So if something happens in the parlor, so those lame cows were the last ones in the group and they're gonna be standing there even longer. So if we are uh, measuring our time away from pen, we need to make sure that we stop the timer when those cows finally get back to the to the parlor because they're going to be away for a lot longer than the first cows into the parlor. So things to help this group of cows, maybe smaller groups from milking, so we're not bringing as many cows to the parlor. Uh, we can reduce the distance of the groups from the parlor and the grouping of lame cows in the pen nearest to the parlor, so they don't have to be as way as as long as the other cows. So talking a little bit about grouping strategies. So when we do group cows, there's some things we should communicate. So what is our targeted stocking density in each group? If it's a group of first calf heifers and we have a new barn with nice wide alleyways and lots of feed space, maybe we can get away with added stocking density. But if we have a herd of cows that 
they're larger cows. We have narrow alleys. Maybe we don't want to do that. And they have some lameness struggles. Maybe we want to make sure they're only one-to-one. The other thing we can do, we can target our refusal rates for each group and target push-up times. And then also make sure we know how long we're, we're locking our cows up or that these cows are forced to stand. We can also increase the observation of these higher risk groups, cows that we know that it's not a perfect situation. We have, you know, slugs of calving throughout the year. So some pens will be more crowded than in other times of year. So we can increase the frequency of our locomotion scoring. We can observe these groups of cows on a weekly or or monthly basis to make sure things are the way they should be. And then again, just feed more frequently or push up feed more frequently to make sure cows are injuring themselves trying to reach feed. Um, so my alma mater, uh, Dr. Mike Hutchins from University of Illinois shares this uh, 4R concept. So when we talk about additives or spending a little bit more money uh, on our diet, we want to make sure this 4R R concept applies to each of these additives. So the first one, response. How does it work? How does this additive work? And will it work on your farm? So does it do what it's intended to do? The second one is return. Do we have a benefit to cost ratio of at least two to one? So if it says, if it costs a penny, do you get two pennies back? Um, And then research, does this additive come from trials that are unbiased and have actual impact? And then number four, we wanna look at records from your farm. Does it actually do what it says that it's intended to do? So we're gonna look at these four things on each additive that is in your diet and If we're feeding biotin, maybe that's something we're going to keep in because it's relatively inexpensive and and we have a a good feeling about what it does for us. But if it's something else, uh, maybe we need to go through these four four concepts and make sure that it is in the right group and we're feeding it for the, the intended reason. All right, switching a little bit, we're going to talk about trimming. Really, I want to focus on two main groups of cows for trimming. I want farmers to think about cows for maintenance trimming. Um, In general, cows should be trimmed twice annually, probably post-peak, 100 days or so, and before dry off. Those are common time points for maintenance trims. But then secondly, the second group of cows are the cows are requiring corrective trimming. We want to see cows at the onset of lameness and see them as soon as possible. So really, these two group of cows, they are two separate groups of cows. We need to make sure that we're allowing time with the trimmer for both of these groups of cows. So I recently read this article from Carl Berge in Progressive Dairy uh, that was published in February, 2021. And I really liked what he had to to say in this. So he has these five parts of a well-timed hoof trimming program. So first we're gonna avoid scheduled trimming in the high risk periods where the impact on future health status or production may be compromised. So he's got this nice schematic on the right that talks about when it is a good time to trim and when you shouldn't trim. So secondly, promote timed hoof trimming by determining optimal trim periods. Third, consider housing and management factors like Lindsay's been talking about to determine our trimming frequency. And then four, use a simple calculation to determine trimming schedule. And five, evaluate hoof health data by days of milk, date, and lactation to determine lameness bottlenecks. So it's a really great article that he wrote, and I encourage you to take a look at it. So one last slide on trimming. I always ask my farmers, what relationship do you have with your trimmer? Do you get feedback from your trimmer on the types of issues that they're finding? Do you have a conversation or do they just show up every Tuesday, you toss them 60 cows and then he's gone? Um, Okay, if, if, okay, I'm glad he's getting 60 cows done, I think, maybe that's good, but I want more. So do you get trim records from them? Uh, Are they paper? Do they input them on the computer? And then how do you use those records? If you just stick them in a binder on the shelf and you never look at them, well, that's, that's great, but let's, let's think about how we can use these records. So can we enter them into software like dairy comp and compare against days and milk, lactation number and trim schedule, like Carl Bertie mentioned. And then I want to ask who helps analyze these results. Are you working with your vet, the trimmer and uh, nutritionist to decide how, how are we doing? How should we change things? Where are our bottlenecks? And then I'm just going to touch one slide on foot baths. Um, but the five things I think about, is it size dependent? If we don't have the correct size, it's absolutely a risk factor for not fixing our lameness. We want to get two dunks per foot minimum. And then do we actually know the measurement of this foot bath to get our correct volume? 
schedule. How many treatment, treatment baths are we running per week? Is that correct? Should we incorporate a soap bath before treatment baths and how they may or may not work on a farm? Product, uh, is the correct amount of product added to achieve proper solution? A lot of times I, I see farms, yeah, we're adding copper. Well, how much are you adding? I don't know, like a third of a bag. And then we actually do the measurement of the bath and we realize we're not even getting anywhere close to the proper solution that we need. Footing, from a cow's perspective, is the floor of that thing slippery? Are there hard nubs that will hurt when we in boots will step on them? So do the cows actually want to step in it? Uh, how's their lighting around it? All these things are risk factors for getting the proper use of our foot bath. And then ease of management. Is it a pain for the employee to fill or clean this bath? And so is it actually not getting done the way that it should be? So if it's not easy to take care of and manage, it's probably not getting done correctly. So let's make it easier to do and manage. All right, back to you, Lindsay. Okay, so um, going off of what Betsy was saying on utilizing that data that we have and how we can track and manage lameness on the farm, I just wanted to share a couple examples that I, I find exciting, especially as someone who is going onto farms and providing that, that second set of eyes and, and working with farms to help improve lameness. We do see that lameness does improve after farms have an assessment, get the results, and when they're provided with support. So um, that graph on the left is from some Novus cows data. They, this is showing our clinical lameness, and these are individual farms across the bottom. And these farms were provided with a cow comfort assessment. They were given feedback, um, benchmarked to other herds, and provided um, with some action items. And then they were given a reassessment anywhere from about six months to two years later. And we can see that that reassessment, that darker circle, tended to be lower. Um, so lameness had improved after these farms had been given feedback. And then the, the graph on the right was a, a similar situation. This was a study done out of the UK. And again, they, they did an initial assessment. And then over the course of a few years, they did follow-up visits. And they had two different groups of farms. The open circles were monitored only. So these farms were given a lameness assessment and then given their data. And that was all. And then this, the dark squares were given the lameness assessment, given the data, and then given a support team and those action items. And uh, what's promising here was that even without that additional support, just tracking the lameness and keeping tabs on it and knowing where you're at, those herds improved as well. But the herds that were given support improved more. And this study actually also tracks the number of changes that those farms were making and you know how they were motivated to make change and what types of changes they made. So this is showing us of those farms that were provided with support, the types of changes that they said they were going to make and that they actually did make. And they broke them down to various different categories. So, you know, changing, try to increase line time or changing standing surfaces, looking at foot baths. So just an example of the types of things that those farms are trying to target and also recognizing, too, that, you know, changing surfaces isn't necessarily always an easy thing. So yes, 250 action items were created, but only 123 were implemented. So being realistic that, yes, we're going to have lots of goals, but let's prioritize them, use those resources available to us, and then address what we think are, are the key things that are going to be having an impact. I like this example. This is a farm that I've been working with, and they started this new tactic where they have a cork board up in their office and every time a cow is found injured or lame, um, they also do it for mastitis, they put a pin where they found her in the barn. So over time, they can start to track where these cows are getting identified. Um, so it could start to indicate, you know, if we start to see a whole bunch of lame and injured cows in the holding pen, okay, that means that we're picking them up in the holding pen. Are they getting, you know, were they falling in the holding pen or are they coming from another pen? Here we can start to see that it looks like there's already a few in this pen. Maybe that's a good thing if they're close to the parlor or is that telling us that something else is going on in pen four? Does pen four happen to be overstocked a lot more or is it, you know, a, a bigger pen so it's taking them longer to milk? But it's kind of a cool and easy way to start to get an idea of, of tracking leanness on the farm and maybe picking up some trends. So recognizing the differences that we need to consider when we're looking at prevention and treatment. So obviously there's different types of lameness, um, infectious versus non-infectious. So if we're having an outbreak of digital dermatitis, then yes, we definitely should be focusing on our foot bath. Whereas if we're having um, a different problem, then focusing on the foot bath probably is not really going to solve it. Also getting an idea of our lame events and severity. So again, this farm I'm working with 
recognize that their lameness is just too high, but they don't really know why. And they have no idea when it's occurring, why it's occurring. So they went back to Dairy Comp. And again, this is where it's key to have those records from your trimmer and have them actually inputted in Dairy Comp. So we can see, you know, are all these animals just a one-time event and we're just getting a bunch of initial lameness, we treat them and they're better? Or are we talking about maybe some third lactation animals that are getting treated for their third time this lactation? And maybe we should stop treating some of these animals, uh, maybe call some of them and address the problem. Do we have a whole bunch of first lactation animals that are getting lame within the first two months of lactation? That's probably telling us that it's not our lactating barn, that it was our heifer barn and our prefresh facilities that were the problem. So figuring out where the problem is occurring, if there is a trend, and then using that to help us solve that problem. And just remembering too, that regardless of the type of lameness that we're talking about, they all benefit from good prevention, early detection, and quick action and treatment. So Betsy and I are going to end now with just two examples of um, very different farms that we've worked with on different studies over the last few years and just showing some of the changes that real farms are making and some of the, the improvements that they're seeing. So this is a Thai style farm in New York and they've made a lot of changes over the years, continuing to grow or continuing to adapt and try to improve. So uh, about 10 years ago now, they did install a, a feed pusher robot. So that was obviously a huge capital investment in terms of the size of the, the farm, but he really felt like having feed in front of those cows at all time was beneficial and it helped reduce his labor um, so he wasn't having to go out there throughout the day to push up feed. A few years ago, he designed some new stall dividers. So his, he just recognized the stalls were not large enough and they were a little too restrictive, but it's pretty hard to make a tie stall larger. So he tried to uh, create a more flexible stall divider. He also moved his tie rail. So that was one thing that he was able to do. And then he put in new pasture mats because he recognized that his, his mattresses, his mats were outdated, which is commonly the case that we're trying to get a little bit too much life out of these mats and mattresses, um, and we should be replacing them probably sooner. So in terms of the investment for his new stall design, it was less than $50 a stall because he did it all himself um, and bought low cost materials. But then obviously the pasture mats were a larger investment. So we have different sizes of investments and changes going on. Just to show you what the farm looked like um, on the left here, we can obviously see those are nice new pasture mats looking very full. And on the right was the, the old the old stall base looking quite a bit harder. You can also see still one remnant of a traditional stall loop here where it was just that steel post going into the ground. And then examples of the new stalls that he designed. So PVC pipe mounted onto the steel. So just providing a little bit more room and flexibility in those stalls and showing that new um, tie rail, how it's moved and just giving them a little bit more space, how it's been, it's been um, adjusted there for, for some of his larger animals. And just another example there of how those animals are, are utilizing those stalls and just to show you too how, how large those animals are and filling up those stalls. So looking at what this did for him. So this was, I just went out onto the farm and, and did some assessments over time. So about almost a year apart, we tracked lameness and hawk injuries and knee injuries, all of which improved. He also said his culling had improved. So he used to lose some good old cows just because they got banged up in his stalls. Additionally, reproduction improved. So its prey rate went up. And ultimately he said, you know, it was obviously some money and some work, but it was worth the investment and worth the work. Um, and he was really happy with it. Uh, the next case study we're going to talk about is in a study that Lindsay, uh, Margaret, and I did that finished up last year. And so this particular farm uh, was a freestyle farm and similar to what the tie stall study that Lindsay discussed, we go out and we do an initial evaluation of uh, lameness and hawk injuries and compare them to the benchmark. So this is what we're looking at here. Benchmark of all 15 firms uh, was in is in the blue, and then this farm, Farm 10, was in the red. And so this farm had almost 6% severe lameness and um, almost 15% mildly lame cows higher than benchmark, certainly, and higher than what we want to see. Uh, they knew that cows were struggling. Um, they had an inkling of what it was. They thought it was probably digital dermatitis, which we you know, figured out, yep, that's what it was. And then this farm also used mattresses 
with betting on top. And so they actually had quite a bit of Hawk scores uh, that were mild injuries, almost 80%, and then 15% severe injuries. So um, some swelling along with hair loss on those Hawks. So, you know, this is something they absolutely wanted to work on and fix and work towards making improvements. So what did the farm do? Uh, so knowing that digital derm dermatitis was an issue on this farm, we looked at the how clean cows' feet were and determined they actually were not clean. So if we have a, a treatment bath and the cow's feet are dirty, that treatment isn't actually getting to the hoof or to the, the skin on the back of the hoof, right? So what we did is we implemented a soap foot bath on non-treatment days. So they did, I think, three days of treatment in a row um, and implemented a soap foot bath on the two days before that to get the feet really clean before treatment days. This was a few months. We did a reassessment. They implemented this a few months before the reassessment. To work on hawk scores, we added bedding one more time a week. And then uh, again, with the digital dermatitis, they prioritized making sure the feet were clean in the parlor. So if there was a cow that had some extra gunk on the back of her foot, um, um, they would try and uh, get it cleaned up with the hose in the parlor. And then the other thing they did, they decreased the stocking density. You know, everybody, most everybody is on a quota system. These cows were also on a quota and uh, decreasing stocking density made sense to go along with that. So the after, so we actually saw like really quick improvements. I do want to say you cannot cull your way out of lameness, right? Um, and so this was several months after they made changes in the foot bath and in uh, bedding protocols. And so their severe lameness was re reduced to 0%, which was awesome. So we see our reassessment in the black bars there. Their first assessment is in the red. And again, the benchmark in blue, they did see an increase of mildly lame, but that's because we don't have any more severely lame cows. So the farm knows they still have a lot of work to do, but the trimmer did say heel warts were much, much better in this situation. So we were making progress. I mean, this was over the winter months too. So everybody knows that dealing with foot baths in the winter months, isn't the most fun thing. So they were encouraged by the improvements they saw. And then on the bedding side with uh, hawk injuries, they saw a drastic increase in, in hawk injuries as well. So we went down to less than 4% severe hawk injuries. The swelling went away. Um, so we're mostly seeing just hair loss, uh, but we had many, many more sound cows without mild injuries. So good job on that. That was with bedding and, and making sure that cows had adequate space to lie down. So it's, it's absolutely a work in progress. This was only a few months in between our initial assessment and the second. So they're still working on these things and trying to get better uh, and reach more sound cows and, and less hawk injuries. So to kind of wrap up, these are our last two slides here. This is uh, from that Nordland and Cook review paper. And I really like this schematic. It is busy, but it's worth walking through. So they talk about the influence of the environment on dairy cow behavior, claw health, and herd lameness dynamics. All of these things are all interplaying, right? So they have on the left there, the trigger factors. So cows that have calving changes, uh, when we do nutritional changes to the diet, a cow that has experienced trauma or inf infectious agents like hoof rot or digital dermatitis. So there's our four trigger factors. So our role of cow comfort, if we increase standing time, uh, that's you know one thing we can do to her. If our walking service is really rough and she's wearing down her feet or we're making her walk a really long way or our surface hygiene, like Lindsay said, if, if it's a really dirty alleyway, that's, those aren't good things. So those three things and, and more cause her to get lame. So claw horn lesions, infectious lesions, and other. So our foot bath program there on the bottom, that can help or hinder. Uh, routine hoof trimming, again, help or hinder. And then are we actually identifying and treating these lame cows? So we can do these things and, and help break the cycle of this lameness, or we can in, in, in turn, like not fix these things and then make sure she's still standing up and not getting time off of her feet and uh, having concussive things happening to her walking surface or pushing up, uh, not pushing up feed. So she's reaching for feed. So again, bringing it back to, you know, we can either break the cycle and fix lameness or she's going to stay lame. Like the, the losses are from reduced milk yield, uh, poor reproductive performance, and then increased risk of early culling. So all of these things that we're talking about, they all are interlinked. So if we can impact what we do to that cow, the management things, the facility that she lives in, we can in, uh, increase how she's doing and, and decrease our lameness. 
So to kind of wrap up our summary slide, just going over this bulleted list, more bedding, clean and dry bedding, large accessible stalls, clean non-slip walkways, adequate heat abatement throughout lactation and the dry period. We wanna recognize issues from increased stocking density, limit our lockup time and our time away from pen. We can go over our nutritional information and target our additives to the specific groups that it makes sense to. We wanna make sure we analyze our trim records and our foot bath protocols, and then monitor and track lameness prevalence types and causes. And then the big thing, changes don't have to be a big investment to still see a positive impact. Small investment can generally, if we make management changes, a lot of times they'll yield really big results. So with that, thank you so much for your attention.